All right, welcome to the next lecture from uh, Web Services. And uh, today we are not going to talk about W3C style web services anymore. <clears throat> today we are going to talk about REST and uh, RESTful web services. And uh, maybe it will actually be something else than what we imagine right now under RESTful web services because um, many web services that are called RESTful nowadays are actually not RESTful. So uh, we'll take a look at what it means to, uh, to be RESTful and to create a RESTful uh, web service. Okay, so um, you might have noticed that uh, with the W3C style web services, there were um, there was a lot of specifications. Those were web standards covering various aspects of uh, the web services ecosystem. Uh, on the other hand, REST is not any standard. It is just a dissertation thesis of uh, Roy, uh, Roy Fielding from, two, from the year 2000. And it is actually an architecture style. So we talked about the web architecture uh, in the introduction to uh, this course. Uh, and uh, REST is also an architectural style. So uh, we talked about the service-oriented architecture. And there is some, uh, some relation to that. but REST itself is an architectural style. It um, doesn't focus on any particular technology. Uh, and uh, it is an architectural style based on four main principles. Um, it is resource orientation. So everything that we want to talk about in our data is a resource. Those resources are uniquely globally identified. Um, the clients and the service communicate in a stateless manner. We already talked about that with HTTP and later with SOAP. And there is a uniform interface, uh, a protocol for, uh, for communication. Um, REST itself is based on the uh, web architect. And um, if you see a RESTful uh, web service or a RESTful API, you will see that it resembles hypertext. We also talked about what hypertext is. It's text with links to other texts, right? So a RESTful API should resemble hypertext. Um, and uh, we'll see how, how that um, is going to look like. Um, so let's first introduce the four principles um, on which REST is, uh, is built. The first one is resource orientation. So as I already mentioned, everything that we want to exchange data about is a resource in REST. And uh, those resources may be even physical objects. Uh, so really everything that you want to talk about using uh, your REST API is a resource. And uh, not uh, every object can be actually, for instance, transmitted over the internet. So for that, you need a representation of that resource. So those are two main things in, uh, in REST. There are resources and there are representations of resources. Those representations are electronic documents in some particular data formats. So you may have an XML representation of uh, this uh, computer, for instance, that is an XML document that you can send somewhere, but it is not the actual resource. The actual resource is, for instance, this uh, computer. So those are two different things, and there is a strict separation in REST between resources and resource representations. Of course, each resource uh, can have uh, multiple representations, perhaps in multiple data formats. So you can have a representation of that computer uh, in XML, in JSON, in HTML, and so on. So those are different kinds of um, representations of one uh, particular resource. Um, when REST talks about data formats, it actually talks about media types, and it really is the same for, uh, for REST 
So we um, already came into contact with media types. And there is a registry maintained by uh, IANA uh, of all media types uh, to be used on the web. And those are the data formats usable in, uh, in REST. Not every media type is a data format usable in REST, but if you want to have a RESTful API and you want to describe a data format, you need to describe it as a media type. Uh, <clears throat> an important requirement on a data type or media type uh, usable in REST is that uh, it needs to support linking because we are talking about uh, the web architecture. Uh, there needs to be a uh, uh, some kind of support for, for linking. And then when uh, you have a client or an application, um, there is a terminological uh, issue because normally you say that your application calls an API. But that's not the case with, uh, with REST. With REST, you actually navigate uh, the API. And there is a difference because navigation comes from basically human interaction with uh, web pages because you also navigate web pages, you do not call them. And uh, because the RESTful API uh, looks like hypertext, ideally, it is also navigated and not called. Um, right. The second principle is uh, resource identification. So every resource needs to be uniquely globally identified. I think you already know where this is going. We can use your eyes to globally uniquely identify everything. So we will do that in, in REST. Um, again, the architecture itself doesn't prescribe any particular technology, but uh, as we already know, uh, your eyes are basically the only usable technology that do, does that on the web. So we will use them to create our um, RESTful APIs. Um, that's because those identifiers are not just identifiers, they are locators. So based on them, we are actually able to access the resource representation on the web which is a useful feature. Now, uh, it may happen that the resource that we talk about is an actual document. So a web, pa web page, an XML file, and so on. And in that case, the resource URI is the same, or URL is the same as the representation URL, because we do not need to have a representation of an XML document that is different than the XML document. But typically, we will be talking about resources that are not the same as their representations. And then both the resources and the representations will have uh, URLs assigned. Um, and those URLs will be different. So uh, URL for my computer will be different than the URL for the XML representation of this computer. Uh, and that will be different from, uh, for instance, the JSON representation of that computer. So those will be uh, different, different URLs. Now, the third principle is about the stateless communication. So uh, we already talked about this with HTTP and with SOAP. Stateless means that uh, everything the server needs to fulfill your request needs to be packed into the request because uh, the, the server doesn't keep any kind of state that uh, allows the server to be simple because it doesn't have to store any, um, anything regarding uh, communication with a certain client and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, therefore it leads to a simpler uh, implementation. Um, therefore the server can uh, focus on how to store data about resources uh, that is different from keeping a state of um, specific communication. So the server stores data about resources and provide some application logic while the client can focus on uh, the user interface and keeping the state of the current communication with the server so that the server doesn't need to do that. So that's uh, the stateless communication. Uh, there are a few rules here, for instance, uh, that uh, the state needs to be the same, uh, the, the resource state needs to be the same for every client. And when a client changes a state of resource, that change is visible again to every client. Um, 
And uh, one important detail here, uh, the responses of a server needs to be cacheable. So when a server responds once to a request and it is a request that is uh, safe and uh, doesn't change the state, it should be cacheable so that uh, when another client does the same request, it can receive a cached copy of, uh, of the response and doesn't need to bother the server with uh, repeated um, requests that basically are the same. So that is also part of uh, the stateless client server communication principle. Uh, and the fourth principle is uh, regarding resource manipulation. So um, the, the basis of uh, RESTful API is that you have your resources and you manipulate the state of the resources um, using a couple of, uh, of verbs or methods. Uh, you need to define those. But typically, those will be uh, words like create, update, retrieve, and delete. So the typical operations that you can do with, uh, with resources on, on the web. You can create a resource, delete a resource, replace it, and uh, uh, get the representation of the resource. So those are uh, sometimes referred to uh, as CRUD operations, create, retrieve, update, delete. Um, and uh, here, the idea is that we have a small set of operations which are applicable to a large set of resources uh, and uh, that is in a, a uniform way so that um, basically the same action on different resources does the same thing. Uh, here, you can already think about mapping that to HTTP, but uh, we will talk about mapping uh, REST to HTTP. Uh, one, uh, best practice example is can be can be seen here uh, this is one of the typical uh, bad design decisions when creating web apis uh, because here in um, by the uris we identify resources right and add customer is not a resource that's an operation uh, so here the api designer actually um, encoded the operation into uh, the url of some kind of resource which is a bad practice from the rest point of view because the actions should be represented by the verbs by the operations and not in uh, uris of, uh, of resources uh, right this brings us to uh, the fact that often enough um, developers view RESTful web services as HTTP based web services and uh, they consider them equal, which is not the case. We will go through um, the RESTful principles applied to web services in a moment, um, but the important distinction here is that uh, REST is the architectural style and it doesn't uh, prescribe any particular implementation. So you can implement rest in any way you want as long as you um, comply with the architectural principles yes http is one of those ways you can implement rest web services with http but it is not the only way of doing that and http is the implementation rest is the architectural principles um right so let's take a look at how REST can be implemented using HTTP. Uh, and again, that's one of the ways of doing that. It is the typical way of doing that, but it is not the only way of doing that. Um, right, so let's take a look at uh, resource identification and uh, access to resources. Uh, there are basically two, um, two situations we can be in. In the first situation, we have a URI of a resource, uh, and that one is not dereferenceable, which means it is not a URL. We cannot access it, but we, we have that identifier. We cannot access it, but we should be able to access the representations of that resource. But since uh, we do not um, or we cannot access the URL of that resource, we need to somehow know the URLs of the representations beforehand. For instance, an example from a Twitter API. I'm not sure if this is still up to date. I, I think not, but still, um, 
There is a user timeline resource that's a clearly defined resource, uh, but by itself it is not be referenceable. If you want to access it, you need to know which representation you want. And based on that, you need to adjust the URL. Uh, and then you get a representation in JSON of that user timeline and representation in XML of that user timeline. Those are two different resource representations of the user timeline resource, which itself doesn't have a dereferenceable uh, URL. Okay, so that's situation number one. Um, it involves some uh, manual, um, manual processes, even though this is quite a typical case again. Uh, the more interesting case is when the resource URL itself is dereferenceable. And then you can ask for a representation in a specific format. So let's say we have a URL of a thing, um, of a resource, and we want a JSON representation of that resource. We can use the URL and in the HTTP accept header, we, want, uh, we can say that uh, we want a JSON representation using the JSON uh, media type. Uh, and uh, the server then responds with uh, 303. Uh, see other and tells us the location of the representation in our requested format. And then we can uh, do step number two, which is access the URL of the representation. Um, it looks something like this. So we have the client. The client sends a GET request to a server um, to some URL. In this case, it's uh, our customer uh, named John. And um, there is the accept header, which we already know. And in this case, it is text XML. Uh, so it should be a XML representation of that resource. The server has an XML representation of the resource under this URL and sends the response to the client. And the client sees a three something HTTP response, which is redirect. And um, well, actually it means that uh, further action is required. Uh, and uh, in this case, in the location header, there will be the URL of the XML representation of the resource and the client gets that uh, representation. This is sometimes also called content negotiation because you ask the server for a representation of a resource in a particular format and the server says, okay, I have that one uh, and it is uh, on this URL. Also, the server may say, I do not have this one, I have other ones, and you can choose from those. Um, so that's why content negotiation, because you negotiate with the server about the, uh, basically the representation of, uh, of the resource. Um, now, um, you might wonder how this can be implemented on a web server. Uh, here we have an example from uh, Apache uh, HTTPD, which is one of the standard, uh, standard web servers. And basically what you want to do is um, um, put uh, this piece of configuration saying, okay, if the, uh, if the request contained um, accept header and it was this, which is um, RDF XML, so it is RDF serialized in XML, it's just a content type, uh, for now, so if if it is RDF XML, then uh, we rewrite the URL to something dot RDF and send a 303 response to to the client. And therefore, when you are the client, you ask for uh, the customer John here, and you get redirected to customer dot RDF named John, and there you can have the RDF XML representation of that resource. So it is really simple to configure a web server to do that. Um, so, uh, no, no issue here. Um, another point um, regarding resource identification is that um, your resources should be identified using so-called clean URLs. Uh, it is an actual term, clean URL. Basically, it means that uh, your resources should not be identified by URLs that contain uh, fragments and uh, query strings and other, uh, other uh, well, I wouldn't say non-standard, but weird parts uh, that just don't look nice. Uh, so uh, to, be, to be specific, instead of using 
this customer and then a query string which uh, basically says that the name needs to be john uh, it's way better to identify john by a clean url like this one so customer slash john and that's it um, Actually, when you search the web for clean URLs, you'll find many other examples, but all of them revolve around not using query parameters for identification of, uh, of resources. Uh, because the query parameters are then used for something else, for actual parameterization of uh, API calls and so on. Um, so it is better when the resource uh, URL is well, clean. And again, uh, it is not a problem to uh, define such clean uh, URLs, even if your web server expects those uh, query parameterized ones. Uh, and uh, an example of a web server configuration is again here. So, uh, yeah, here basically you, you take customer slash and now the name here. You store it and uh, you re again redirect, or actually, in this case, the client doesn't know about it. It's just a server rewrite. So the server actually accesses customer.rdf because of this content type um, question mark. And this is the parameter uh, based on the name in the URL. So, again, no problem in configuring a web server to actually use clean URLs, even if the implementation behind it expect something like this right so that was uh, resource identification and resource representation identification and retrieval now let's talk about the verbs so the operations that you can do uh, the restful uh, operations the CRUD operations that you can do and how you can do them using http well uh, there is basically a one-to-one -one mapping to HTTP methods, some of them at least. Um, there is get, which is retrieve. Uh, you basically get a representation of a resource. This operation is, uh, uh, or should be read-only without side effects. Um, it should be safe and uh, it should be also cacheable. So uh, if you have a web cache on the way from the client to the server, and the web cache sees the get, uh, get request, it can cache uh, the response. Uh, put is uh, basically uh, an update operation. So it replaces the rep representation of a resource with another uh, representation of the resource. Delete is delete and post uh, submits data to be processed by the resource in some way. Uh, we'll get to the details of that, uh, of that later. Uh, but this is basically the mapping of uh, the restful operations to uh, to HTTP. Now, uh, like this, you could already start building a, a restful web API. Uh, but uh, let's first have a look at something called the Richardson maturity model. It is actually uh, a way of measuring how restful an API is. And there are four levels to that model. Um, and it is kind of a pyramid and it deals with uh, resource representation, the choice of verbs and the inclusion of hypermedia in the API um, that we are actually measuring. There are many different visualizations of uh, this Richardson maturity model, um, but um, uh, we will we'll use this one. Um, and with this one, uh, we'll start here in the swamp of Fox. Fox is a sh acronym for plain old XML. So this Richardson maturity model actually uh, takes what we know from the W3C style web services and from SOAP. Um, it takes it as a level zero. So that's where we start. And now we'll build on it to, um, to, to achieve restful uh, web services in the end. Uh, so again, let's start with level zero because that is something that we already know. Those are W3C style web services. And uh, if you remember still how we use W3C style web services from the HTTP point of view, we basically have a URL of an endpoint and we post some data to that endpoint and we receive 
a response. That's how we communicate with AW3C style or soap based web service. Um, and one of the one of the use cases of soap based web services is RPC that we have already tried and seen in the tutorial. So basically, the application doesn't need to know that it actually uses a web service. It just uh, calls a method. It uses soap and all, all that. Uh, but uh, from the application's point of view, it is just uh, uh, a method call. So that's uh, that's RPC. From the point of view of the Richardson maturity model, this is level zero. It uses one URI, that's the URI of the endpoint. It uses one verb, that's the post method used to send the data to uh, from, from the client to the server. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, some examples um, and how they work on level zero. All those examples will be uh, in the domain of uh, actually booking an appointment with your doctor. So let's book an appointment with our doctor um, using a level zero web service. So we have our uh, endpoint URL and we have our post HTTP method. So everything basically needs to happen uh, in the data. So we post to this web service, a open slot request. We want to see what slots are open on this date for this particular doctor. What we get is uh, HTTP um, 200, which is okay. And uh, we get a response with a list of open slots. And we can see that uh, there is a slot from 2 p.m. and there is a slot from 4 p.m. for this particular doctor. And we can choose one and we can book it. Um, so let's book it. We use another web service with uh, another URL. Uh, actually, it is yeah, it is the same uh, same web service with the same URL. Just the data is different. So we use the same method, post to the same web service, but this time in the data we have appointment request uh, for the particular doctor in this uh, time slot that we have seen before that is free, and uh, we identify ourselves as uh, patient J Smith. Uh, the response here, if everything goes okay. Uh, is HTTP 200, and we have um, information about the appointment. This means that we have successfully booked the appointment. If something goes wrong, though, we still get HTTP 200, okay. However, in the data, we'll see that something went wrong. For instance, uh, if we get a SOAP uh, fault in W3C style web service, we still get HTTP 200, everything is okay. But in your data, you have a fault and something went uh, went wrong. For instance, that the slot is not available or something like that. But that something went wrong, we know from uh, from the data, not from the communication here. Okay, so let's move one level up. Uh, let's use your eyes to actually identify resources. Um, the rest um, is still the same. So we have. Uh, your rights for resources, but we have one HTTP verb and you no know, hypermedia. So let's do the same, but now with a level one web service. So now uh, our doctor has a URI because we use URIs to identify resources. So uh, our doctor, M. Jones, has this URI, and we post our request uh, for, um, uh, for open slots. Uh, to that URI, and we get HTTP 200 with the list of uh, uh, slots. And um, uh, then each slot also has a URI because we use URIs for identification of resources. And therefore, when we want to, uh, want to book that slot, we post some data to that slot with the patient ID, and we get uh, that it is okay, and we have an appointment in that slot. So that's the difference here. Every resource has its own URI. We no longer have one URI for the web service endpoint. We have separate URI for each of those resources. Okay, let's now move one level up, and we will use different uh, verbs to actually manipulate those resources. So we will use uh, the create, read, update, and delete operations uh, on the HTTP level on top of what we already had. 
we have a level two web service and uh, how this goes is that uh, we use HTTP get method to actually get something uh, which is new here because before we used post to communicate with the web service. So now uh, we use get and uh, we use this URI to get actual slots of this doctor um, within uh, with this date that are still open. And we use get. Using get means that the response can be cached, which is not the case with post because post is not a safe method and therefore the response to post cannot be cached. With get, this can be cached. So when another client requests the, the, the list of the slots, uh, also using get, they can get the cached version of that. Okay, so we get uh, the, the list of slots and we get 200. Okay, here we have the list of possible slots. Um, we want to uh, do uh, an appointment in that slot. Therefore, we want to send something for processing. So we have the URI of that slot and we post uh, our request to that uh, slot. So here we use post. And as a response, uh, we no longer get just 200 OK. We get 201 created. So your appointment was created. And in the location header, we get the URL of the appointment that we just created so that we can later uh, use it, for instance, to cancel the appointment or to schedule some tests for the appointment and so on. So now our appointment gets a URL and there is some data about that appointment. When uh, there is a problem, for instance, that the slot is uh, no longer available, uh, we get another response code such as um, 409 conflict, you cannot uh, book this slot. Uh, the assignment of the HTTP response codes is up to the API designer. So uh, there is no uh, like uh, prescribed mapping. The API designer needs to um, map the HTTP response codes to the actual meaning for their API. Okay, so this is a level two web service. We can now use various HTTP methods to manipulate the resources, but still something is missing. Uh, and the missing part is called uh, HATIUS, uh, which means or is an acronym for hypertext as the engine of application state. Um, what was missing was basically the thing that I started this lecture with, and that is that a RESTful API should look like hypertext. What we have seen so far did not look like hypertext because we didn't have any actual links to anywhere uh, during the communication. So we need that. And uh, let's have a look at how such uh, an API looks like. So now we will talk about a level three web service. Uh, we'll get the list of slots uh, open on that date. And uh, in the response, we get not only the, uh, the information about those slots, but we also get links to uh, what we can do next. So here uh, we have this slot and uh, we see that if we want to book that slot, we need to send a post um, request to this URL. And if we want to book this slot, so the, this rel uh, identifies the operation that we want to do. This identifies the booking operation. Um, so if you want to do this, uh, you send a request of this type to this URL. Now this looks like hyperdex because with each response, you can see what else you can do. And it looks like when you are reading a hypertext um, document, because you can see where else you can go to read something, uh, something more. Uh, it is not just that you have the links to the things. Um, it actually changes something uh, in uh, the design of the server and the client, because here, the server tells you the URL of the next thing you want to do or you can do. And therefore, the client should not have those URLs like hard coded or something like that. It should always listen to what the server tells uh, the client about the URLs. Um, the advantage here is that the server can, for instance, change the scheme of the URLs um, or the, the patterns in the URLs, and the clients do not break because they take the URLs from the responses. They do not assume that they know 
the URLs of uh, particular API calls. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, then we post uh, an appointment request to uh, a particular slot here, and we get the 201 created as before. But here in the appointment, we have again links to what we can do next. We can cancel the appointment um, uh, on this URL, and we can add some tests, schedule some tests on uh, another URL, and so on. So again, links to other possible actions. Right, so that's a level three uh, web service. But if you take a look at the model with level three, we are here. We have still not achieved a truly restful uh, API because level three in the Richardson maturity model is just a prerequisite for a uh, restful API. Um, the other things are not covered by the maturity model, but uh, we talked about those. For instance, that uh, the client should not basically have anything hard-coded. It should look at the hypermedia controls in the responses. Um, there need to be uh, data types defined or data formats defined in form of media types, um, which include um, description of the relations that you can get in the responses. For instance, that uh, a certain URI represents uh, a booking operation of an appointment and different URI uh, represents um, cancellation of that uh, booking and so on. All that should be um, defined in, uh, in media types. And um, therefore, when you have a um, RESTful web service and you want to create a client for it, all you should really need is the initial URI of one of the things in that API and uh, a set of media types used by that uh, API because that contains all the documentation that you need and all the actions and the, uh, and the URIs are then served to you in, um, in the communication. Uh, right. Okay, so if you build a web service like this, then it is a restful uh, web service. It uh, allows you to manipulate the resources and their representations using, uh, using HTTP methods. Um, and uh, you use it just as a web application. Um, you use the web application just as you would go through a web as a human uh, being. Now, uh, to take a look at a more detailed overview of the mapping of uh, the HTTP methods to REST, there are actually two kinds of resources. Uh, one is a collection, and uh, a collection of uh, I don't know, uh, open slots or something like that. And then individuals. So we have collections and individuals and the mapping of the HTTP methods differs a little bit um, regarding uh, or based on whether you actually are talking about a collection or an individual. Uh, if you have the get method, then you get uh, the list of uh, members of a collection or you get the representation of the individual. That's quite clear. Um, a uh, more major difference is with the put method, which basically, basically overrides a representation or uh, the, in the, um, the resource. But uh, in case of individuals, this basically means that you change the individual to what you are putting there. In case of collections, it basically means that you are discarding the old collection and replacing it with another collection, which might be uh, a bit dangerous so uh, and maybe unexpected, but that is what uh, put should do with a collection. Then delete is quite straightforward. You delete an individual or a collection. And post, again, to a collection means that you want to add a member to that collection um, or uh, post to an individual, maybe a part of a creation of a part of the individual. But in that case, basically, it is uh, viewing the individual as a collection of parts. So uh, yeah, that's the mapping of, uh, of post. Now, this is it for RESTful Web Services. What uh, needs to be said is uh, some kind of comparison of RESTful Web Services to the traditional W3C style web services. And there is one uh, analogy called a letter analogy where basically the analogy says that uh, 
sending uh, or using soap is like mailing a letter because you need to put that letter into an envelope and um, you need to label the envelope and all that while rest is like sending a postcard which is easier to handle um, waste less paper which means uh, uh, bandwidth or resources uh, and here the comparison falls a bit short because it says that the uh, uh, postcards typically have a uh, short content, while letters uh, can have long content. But of course, with REST and HTTP, you can have uh, content also uh, in uh, any length you want. So uh, here it's uh, a bit uh, iffy the comparison, but it is one of the analogies that you can you can uh, find somewhere. Uh, a more formal comparison is uh, like this with some criteria like uh, the protocol used, where with uh, W3C style web services, um, basically you can use any transport protocol you want, uh, as long as uh, you use SOAP on top of it. Um, there is also a binding of uh, W3C style web services directly to HTTP without SOAP, but that is almost never used. Uh, so typically, uh, W3C style web services is a synonym for SOAP based web services. Uh, in REST, uh, you can um, use any protocol you want as long as it follows the architectural style. In practice, this is almost always HTTP. With um, uh, regarding data formats in W3C style web services, again, there is kind of support for any format, but typically it is always XML. Uh, with REST, there is a variety of formats or representations that you, you get. Uh, both stacks use stateless communication because uh, basically this is what uh, communication on the web requires. So both stacks are intended for the web and therefore they are stateless. Uh, with SOAP, there is, missing, uh, there is a missing support for caching because caching in the traditional sense uh, requires um, usage of safe methods. Um, so basically, um, you can cache uh, get, you can maybe cache a response to delete. Um, there is some support on the level of HTTP for um, representation of whether or not a resource actually changed uh, since we requested it last in uh, the form of e tags. There is nothing really like that in uh, W3C Star Web Services. Then with verbs, we already know this comparison. In SOAP, you use post for everything. Here, you have a variety of verbs. Regarding security, however, uh, the advantage is on uh, the W3C style end because with uh, REST, you have uh, basically HTTPS, and that's it. But that's a uh, point to point security. So you have a client, you have a server, and that's it. There is no standard way of actually ensuring uh, security in uh, an end to end fashion, such as we have seen with web service security and uh, the SOAP intermediaries. So if your message passes through many nodes, then, uh, and you want to ensure some kind of security, then there is a standard for that by W3C, but there is no standard like that. Uh, in the restful world. Uh, and um, then you can also have asynchronous processing of messages. There is support for that uh, directly in HTTP, uh, but there is also a standard uh, in the W3C style world. We have not mentioned this one, but there is one. Um, so uh, mainly the, the, the biggest difference is that with W3C style web services, you have a huge amount of standards that you can use um, to uh, for, for basically anything you want to do with web services. That is why W3C star web services are used mainly in e-government, in uh, industry, and so on, while RESTful web services are kind of lightweight and are used in uh, on the web, uh, where you do not need such a strict uh, adherence to standards. Because uh, there are not many standards in uh, on the web. Uh, that is both an advantage and a disadvantage sometimes. Uh, right. One more thing I want to mention. Uh, we talked about Wizzle 
in W3C Style Web Services, a language for description of interfaces. Uh, with uh, RESTful Web Services, there is not a standard, but uh, it is a submission to the, the W3C, which didn't go anywhere. So it stayed a submission, but it is supported in some tools and it is called a Waddle Web Application Description Language. It is quite simple, can be explained on this little example. Uh, you might have noticed that in SOAP UI, which we use in the tutorials quite often, there is also uh, support for Waddle. Um, basically, it's an XML document describing a, uh, well, now I don't need to say RESTful API, but HTTP API. So it doesn't need to adhere to all the RESTful uh, rules. It can be any HTTP API and uh, it can be described like this. Basically, you have the application here. That's the root element of Waddle. And then you have a list of resources. Those resources are basically URIs of things you can send some requests to. Um, you define a base URI so that you don't repeat yourself um, all over the document. And all the remaining uh, URIs are re uh, relative to, to this one. And then, uh, so now the base is example.com slash API. Uh, and every time we use or see a path attribute, we add a slash and what is inside the path attribute. So there is um, a resource called books, so API slash books, and you can uh, call a get method on the books. And uh, well, that's it about books. Then there is a resource called readers, and you can again use the get method for uh, accessing readers. Um, now, under books, there is a sub resource with a path uh, that looks like this. This means that this is a a parameter or a variable uh, called book ID. Uh, and it is in those places, which means that there can be anything. And we will refer to that anything by the book ID name. And it is a parameter of, uh, of the course to this resource. Uh, it is required. Uh, it is a template style parameter. So when you pass a parameter as part of the URL path, like this one, uh, it is a template style parameter named book ID. So this is the same, uh, that's the name of the parameter. And you can use it with get and delete. And uh, well, that's it. And then under book ID, you get slash reviews. So reviews of a certain book with a certain book ID. And you can get the reviews. Um, there you need to parameterize the call uh, using uh, page and size. Both are um, parameters, they are not required. And they are query style parameters, which means that they go into the query part of the URL, not the path part here. And there are some default values. And as a response here, you may expect 200 uh, and uh, you may request representation in XML and JSON. So something, something like this can be used to describe um, uh, an API, um, which is HTTP based. Uh, now, we mentioned query style parameters and template style parameters. There are actually um, two more parameter styles. One is header, which means that the parameter to that call goes into the HTTP header. And there is a matrix style parameter, which looks like this. Basically, they are separated by semicolons and not in the traditional query, um, query style like this. Uh, yeah, so that's Waddle, a very short introduction. Uh, actually, in um, the tutorial uh, and in the homework, we'll use OpenAPI, which is a specification of how HTTP-based web services should be described. There is an editor swagger uh, for uh, this specification, which allows us to uh, write the specification in a way that is uh, human readable and also um, allows us to, to include examples which are executable. So it is quite a nice way to uh, describe an API. Okay, so that's it for RESTful web services. Uh, one more thing, if your web service uh, does not uh, comply with, uh, well, is not a level three web service according to the Richardson maturity model, uh, then the question is what you should call it because it is not a RESTful web service, not a REST 
web service. In that case, you should call it an HTTP based web service because uh, all you can actually say about it is that you can use HTTP to access it, but it doesn't comply with any of the other rules. So, um, yeah, so the, the most of the web services that claim to be RESTful actually are just HTTP based and not really RESTful, unless they, of course, behave in the way that uh, you've talked about. Right, so that's it for today. Uh, we will try to build, well, an HTTP based web service in the tutorial and describe it using OpenAPI. Um, are there any questions?